In the early 2000s, um, uh, from a grant through the U.S. Department of Energy, um, Oregon State was actually able to build another test facility, uh, and it's called the Multi-Application Small Light Water Reactor Test Facility. Now, it's a very different type of reactor than what you see here behind me. Um, you know, the Advanced Plant 1000 is um, a very large nuclear reactor. Uh, it has some very advanced passive safety features, which, which make it, you know, even safer than the current generation of very safe nuclear reactors. Uh, but the multi-application small light water reactor is kind of a different paradigm when it comes to nuclear power. It's basically using nuclear power in a much smaller package. So instead of generating something along the lines of a thousand megawatts like the AP-1000 would if it was in operation, uh, the multi-application small light water reactor is really more along the lines of about 35 megawatt electric. So it's a much smaller package, uh, you know, but also a much smaller um, electrical output. So it allows for a little bit more flexibility in the sense that if you had a very small um, you know, requirement for power in a, in a remote location, the Maslar, the multi-application small light water reactor, may be a very good fit for that. But at the same time, if you had a very large requirement for power, like a thousand megawatt electric requirement, you could put a number of these small Maslar modules together in kind of a field concept to get that larger electrical output. So what we have here underneath this insulation is, is the vessel, the reactor vessel. And inside of that vessel sits a basically a, a metal um, cylinder. And inside the metal cylinder is where the, the reactor core would sit. Now again, in our test facility, we're, uh, we're only using um, electric heaters and no radioactive material. But um, that radioactive core, or the, the core in the real reactor, will sit inside of that kind of uh, that metal tube and it would allow the water to heat up, which then will rise up through the tube and then spill out the top of the tube very high up in the, in the facility or in the real reactor. And then wrapped around the outside of the tube are going to be cooling coils, which we'll use then to make the steam, which will turn the turbines, which will then turn the generators. But the process of those cooling coils up high out on the outside of the tube causes the water then to fall. So in essence, the water falls on the outside of that tube inside of the vessel, then gets pulled up on the inside due to the heating of the core, and then comes out the top again. So in essence, we don't need a pump to actually pump the water around in this facility. It's all basically that natural process of heating water, hot water rises, and then cooling it up high, and the cold water falls down. So in essence, that's how we drive the, the cooling in this type of reactor. No pumps involved. So it's, again, it's a very different model, a very different paradigm than what you see in the current generation of nuclear reactors, which require pumps to push the water around the system. This multi-application small light water reactor is actually the basis for um, the new scale power incorporated reactor design, which again is a technology that kind of grew out of the research that occurred here at Oregon State um, a number of years ago. We built a small scale model of this Maslar concept uh, in, in one of our other laboratories. And through that um, DOE grant, we were able to run a number of tests, again, testing it during normal operations to kind of prove the concept, but also try to test it during some off normal and some accident conditions. Now, as a direct output from that work, um, you know, one of our professors here at Oregon State, Dr. Jose Reyes, was able to work with the university and spin that concept out um, for commercialization. So if you, you know, uh, f go to downtown Corvallis, uh, there's a company called New Scale Power Incorporated, and you know, their reactor design uh, basically is a direct result of some of the work that was done here at OSU uh, in this research back in the early 2000s. OSU did a wonderful thing by starting a, a research project with the Department of Energy and a national lab. That formed the genesis of the idea of this simple, modular, passively safe nuclear power module. Um, over the course of a number of years, that project uh, transferred from a, a Department of Energy-led um, activity to an OSU-led activity where the design matured. And at around 2007, a uh, new scale formed and uh, through a technology transfer agreement, uh, the intellectual property that underpinned OSU's module transferred to New Scale uh, to allow us the opportunity to commercialize the concept. Our system, our solution, looks to deploy small modular reactors, reactors that are much smaller in terms of physical dimensions and power production, 
such that each one of our reactors, rather than producing 1,000 megawatts of electricity, will produce about 45 megawatts of electricity. One new scale module could maybe produce enough electricity for, say, Albany. Another could produce enough power for Corvallis, for example. A new scale power plant can be built to contain as few as, say, two of these modules and as many as 12. So the solution is scalable from around 90 megawatts of electricity up to perhaps 540 megawatts of electricity. This instrument is called a Geiger counter and it essentially measures radiation. Now the reason we're hearing counts right now is uh, because we're right now we're being bombarded with background radiation. So there's radiation from the stars, there's radiation from uh, the dirt, there's radiation from uranium in the dirt, radiation from potassium. All of those uh, factors account for background radiation. Now, uh, when this thing were to encounter something that's radioactive, now this is uranium. This is actually what goes into nuclear fuel. You can see this thing sets it off, and because there is, is slightly radioactive. From a perspective of nuclear power, you know, when we dig that uranium out of the ground and you turn it into fuel, and we basically use it in the reactor, we have to maintain basically um, infinite responsibility for that, for that waste. So we don't have the ability to take our waste and just get rid of it and, you know, just kind of, you know, get rid of it and walk away from it. We have to maintain responsibility for all of our waste indefinitely, you know, for, forever for all intents and purposes. And that actually cost is built into the cost of nuclear power. So to some extent, although, you know, people always say, well, nuclear power is more expensive than coal and natural gas, and that's kind of a bad thing, the reality is that we actually are the only power source um, that actually has to maintain responsibility for our waste Forever. My research and my group, we're all focused on what's called advanced reprocessing, so we're looking at the chemistry of nuclear waste and how to recycle it. Nuclear fuel can be a renewable energy source, but not in the way the United States burns it. So here in the U.S., we use what's called an open fuel cycle. And what that means is after the fuel is burned, it's dumped, it's stored, it, it, it's considered waste. Now, what uh, France, Japan, the United Kingdom, Russia, they all use what's called a closed fuel cycle. Now what that means is they take that used nuclear fuel, they manipulate it and they recycle it back into nuclear reactors. The most important reason to recycle nuclear waste is because we don't have anywhere else to put it. Uh, recently in the news, the issue of Yucca Mountain came about and I was actually opposed to Yucca Mountain because it's simply sweeping everything under the rug. Nuclear energy's power is strange because as you're burning fuel, you're actually producing more, the way nuclear physics works. With recycling, we're essentially burning that free fuel. We're extending the life of nuclear power by hundreds and hundreds of years if we recycle. And it's, it's just it's a viable solution to the nuclear waste problem. Uh, I'm David Bightwork. I'm a graduate research assistant here at Oregon State. Um, I'm in the Department of Nuclear Engineering and Radiation Health Physics. I work on the sort of environmental side of our department. Um, we do sort of work with radiation in the environment. Um, we're primarily interested in understanding how radioactive elements move around in the environment. A lot of the work I do is related to um, modeling how waste repositories, like the proposed uh, site at Yucca Mountain, if there eventually were releases to the environment, where might those releases go and would they be a, pro would they be a problem? What you see here are some uh, wheat plants that I'm currently growing. We're going to uh, irrigate them with uh, radioactive chlorine. We're going to expose the leaf and the above ground portion of the plant to chlorine 36 and see how it moves inside the plant, whether the radioactive chlorine moves to the edible portion, the actual grain that people eat, or whether it, stay, whether it moves to the root tissue or to the uh, just the, the chaff that uh, goes uneaten. We're doing this because uh, we want to understand if there is a radiation in the environment, we want to understand where it goes and whether it's going to be a problem or not.